<laughs> that was that was a highly professional beginning to my stream as ever. Um, <laughs> apologies for that. I thought I clicked the mic button. I must have just missed the icon. So apologies for that. I had I had actually clicked it. Hasn't I wasn't actually. Oh, I'd forgot. Um, but there we go. Anyway, right. So I've moved the camera. There seems to be a small bug in my in the webcam. Now I've got a. It's not a bad camera actually. It's called a Razer something something something. I, as you know, I'm not a very technical person. Um, well, I try to have actually. It's not true. Um, years ago, I used to be a really technical person. Okay, I used to actually be a developer a long, 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 long time ago, and I had to know about stuff. I try really hard nowadays to. Um, to to not be a technical person I, I i feign as much ignorance as possible because i really can't be bothered anymore um is tonight's topic try and travel well no it's not but um the doctor who is 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 kind of kind of hooked into it we, we, we will we will obviously at some point at some point in the stream as we always do get to the topic of time travel uh, not the time travel though what we're talking about to the topic just to the topic actually we'll get to the topic uh, maybe i should go back in time five minutes and start this all over again make it really really professional but anyway <laughs> you know me by now <laughs> um anyway <laughs> anyway it's lovely to see everybody thank you very much for popping along to this this crazy thing that we do every monday well i mean i mean it's, i think it's particularly crazy for you guys because i mean i'm here and i'm talking and i'm kind of um just you know waffling on about a subject of my choice um as you guys actually tune in and listen which is i think entirely insane but there we go never mind never mind um we will get to it now um um, yeah, so no, I'm not a very technical person. I try and avoid being a technical person as much as possible, because um, then <laughs> I mean, one of the things you must never do, um, and and young young people in IT make this mistake. Okay, you must never ever ever admit that you know anything about computers. Okay, because then um, <laughs> somebody's oh my email's not working. Can you come around and fix it? And seven hours later. <laughs> It's still installing batches and updates to their you know, ridiculously ancient laptop trying to make it work. You know, don't, don't do that. So, no, 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 I don't know anything about computers at all. <laughs> Bilbo Gavins is a young person in IT. Okay, so here's some advice for you, Bilbo Gavins. Never admit to anybody that you know anything about computers. Just shake your head. No, 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 no. They're just... <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, they're always going wrong. They're, they're dreadful things. You, what, what you want to do is you want to find somebody. Uh, yeah, but me? No, 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 no. <laughs> Don't admit to anybody you know anything about computers, all right? Um, <laughs> it's a, that's a really good piece of advice. Um, otherwise, you're sucked into fixing people's browsers and emails and <laughs> God knows what for, forever, basically. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just magic, yeah. Um, it's kind of the same with cars, actually. Don't you know? I, you know, I, you know it's, it's difficult to avoid sometimes because people see me working on my car in my garage. Um, you know, you, you know something about cars, do you? I said, well, only, only, only really old ones. I can't help you with anything modern. Oh, that's a shame because I was thinking maybe you could help me buy one. Yeah, that's, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really your guy. Sorry, <laughs> anything that's less than twenty years old, I just don't know anything about. <laughs> so just, no, 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 no. I'll give you any advice. Uh, Professional never, says Freaky Deaky Doo. This is a Drew's dream. <laughs> You're quite right. Um, I like to think of it as a sort of informal formality. You know, there's, there's, there, there are proceedings in, our, in, our, in, our, in my streaming. You know, we have to start off with something breaking, clearly. <laughs> something performing slightly erratically. Then obviously there's the waffle segment, which we're now in, if you if you hadn't realised. Um, and then we ultimately we do get to the yeah, so there is there is structure, there is format, there is flow, there is uh, there, there is established protocols for everything that happens in my streams, kind of, sort of, maybe a bit, hopefully somewhere along the line. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, dear, off we go. Right. So yeah, my my intro screen now. Um, those of you saw at the beginning. Now, a friend of mine um, has recently started mucking about with cameras, and um, he he said, I'm, I'm, "I'm doing this thing called light painting. Do you do you fancy having a go?" I said, "Yeah, okay." So come around. So he came around to my house um, and stuck me, <laughs> me and my wife in a dark room, and then pointed the camera at us uh, without any lights. Okay, and then then sort of flash lights. So the idea behind this is like light, light painting. Is basically you put your camera on. A thirty-second exposure in a dark room. So there, are, there, there can't be any lights, okay? Which is, means it is quite hard to figure out what's going on because, of course, you can't see anything. Um, you put your camera 
you know, digital SLR type thing, as it was in this case, on a 30 second exposure with no no light source in the room. And then basically you wave some lights about, some small lights, your little LEDs or your little wands, that sort of thing, in the background, and it paints colors. And that's basically how that works. So I had to sit still <laughs> with, <laughs> with, my, with my sphere, uh, my crystal wall, um, for 30 seconds without moving with a, an expression on my face. So I thought I could, I could, I could kind of, you know, I could do that kind of wistful looking off into the distance sort of thing. I could, I could do a sort of kind of like stern kind of, hmm, you know, I could do that. Or I could just glare menacingly at the camera with a kind of, like that. So that's what, that's what I ended up with. Um, basically the trick was for whatever, um, whatever pose that you decide on, you've got to sit still for 30 seconds. Uh, so, and, and obviously I hold the crystal ball still for 30 seconds. Um, and um, actually that's harder than it sounds because um, one thing I did notice is of course, when it's totally pitch black, you know, you, you know where the camera is, it's about one well, six feet away um, and you're looking at it. And then when it does go completely black and they, they start pressing the shutter, of course you can't see the camera. So immediately you've got your eyes are sort of beginning to wander because there are no reference points. I said, am I still looking at the camera? Or <laughs> where is the camera? And then when there is a little bit of illumination as the lights get moved around, um, you can sort of see the camera. Oh, no, it's off to the left a bit. So I've got to readjust my eyes. <laughs> I'm trying not to move my head while I'm doing it, um, which is why my face is very, very slightly blurred. That's not actually that the camera is out of focus. Uh, it was kind of me not being able to hold still <laughs> precisely enough. Um, so it's, it's quite tricky. So I'm going to have to train myself. Yeah, that was kind of a first step, but I thought it might be a bit of fun. So there we go. Anyway, that's the explanation for the start screen. Um, in in other thoughts, okay, so <laughs> last week um, I was um, un... <laughs> <laughs> it's ripping into a um, a dragon film, okay, <laughs> as, as we discussed. Um, so, um, um, and oddly enough, so in that, yeah, for those of you who recall, the DVD that I had was a three-piece DVD. Now, it turned out that DVD 2 was actually um, film number one, and DVD 1 was actually film number two. So I'd actually watched the sequel to the first film before I watched the first film. And there was supposed to be three. It's supposed to be a trilogy, <laughs> as it turns out. The third, <laughs> third part of the film never got made. <laughs> so not only did I watch it out of order, I've now watched a series of two films, of which the third one hasn't happened and probably never will. Basically, <laughs> so that was a bit weird. Um, so, um, so that's um, so that that was the thing. Um, and I, I did put a few tweets out. I don't know if you saw them on Twitter. And I, I looked the cast up and I tagged a few of them in, in, um, in <laughs> mischievously. And I said, because basically what I wrote, I thought, well, if the ending isn't coming, I'm going to write the ending. So on Twitter, I did a series of tweets and I wrote the ending <laughs> as I expected it to happen. Um, and I actually got a response <laughs> to the actors in the film. <laughs> One of whom was playing the large guy who was um, kind of the sidekick, who basically said, um, yeah, we, 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 we try not to talk about those films. And he said, go and look up on, on YouTube at the making of. There are some, he says, that'll tell you what was going on. So there's clearly an interesting story behind that. And then the guy, it was slightly embarrassing for me, then the guy who wrote it, Okay, which I'd also tagged in the tweet. Because you know me, I, I like to prod. I'm a bit mischievous. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter who it is, whether it's, you know, in the gaming world, I'm, I poke Frontier with a stick every go every so often. Um, or, you know, you know, that's just me, I'm sorry. I'm, 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 a, I'm a bad guy, okay? <laughs> but I'm, 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 I'm not, I'm, I'm okay. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a saint. And I will not, I will not be canonized, okay? And anyway, so he basically said at the end of my kind of, this is what happens. Um, he basically said, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> it's sort of signed off. Um, with that, yeah, you need to chuck in more Princess Bride references. Um, what was the film called again? Now, it goes by many names. Now, let me the, the first one, let me get this correct. The first one is called Knights of the Damned. Okay. And it's a sort of, <laughs> it's a weird sort of cross between a, a um, zombie apocalypse tale and a kind of medieval quest. It's quite hard to describe. Now, to be fair to it, 
and because I watched the second film first, I, un, I, I slightly, well, quite unfairly, actually, in hindsight, ripped into the second film a lot because I assumed it was the first film. Because um, it was DVD one in the case, so it's not an unreasonable assumption to make. Um, anyway, so anyway, the first, the second film doesn't make any sense if you haven't watched the first one. However, it does make a bit more sense if you watch the, the the actual first one first. So Knights of the Damned is the first one. It's got much better cinematography and a few other bits and pieces in it than the second film has, which is the one I watched first. Now the 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 um, the second film is goes by several names now I think it's been released multiple times to kind of know, try and claw back some of its yeah the, the money that was spent on it um, it's sometimes called the dark kingdom and sometimes called the dragon kingdom um, and I think you know, just stick dragon in there to kind of make it make it cool um, so yes yeah, so that, that was the thing but I was quite chuffed that the, some of the actors actually got in touch so it's worth researching. Um, and apparently the budget for the first film was 6.3 million, which sounds like a lot of money, but apparently that's that's absolute peanuts for making that sort of film. So um, so it's an interesting thing. Now, it has, it has certainly reinforced my thinking that if somebody approaches me and says, would you like to make a budget version of Shadewood? Yeah, the, uh, the sci-fi series that I've written. Um, the answer would be a resounding no. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you could launch a Kickstarter to the tune of a hundred million, or thereabout, uh, no, <laughs> I don't want any of my stuff converted into a slightly cheesy, um, <laughs> low rent B movie at all. That's not how I see the future of my work. So, um, so that's that's the thing, you know. So if you're if you're um, if your work, uh, you know, on a slightly serious note, if your work does ever get optioned for television or film. You know, it's it's something to have a think about as to you know, okay, how much money are we talking about here? What level of quality of production are we talking about here? Because um, it is nowadays possible to make some very very ropey CGI, etc. 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 And I do, to be honest, I do admire people having a go. You know, the, the enthusiasm shines through. Uh, to be honest, one of the redeeming features of that sort of stuff. But um, the end result. Uh, <laughs> Not something I would want to put my name to. Let's put it like that. Um, so, so, so that's 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 good. That's basically where I was with that one. Um, so, um, yeah. So interesting, interesting. You know, and interesting thought process going on with it. You know, the production of films like that and all that kind of good stuff. But um, um, again, um, <laughs> the one the one beautiful thing, and I, I must admit, I've been doing the um, I've been doing more of the audio editing for Shape, but that's how far I've got, by the way. Uh, I'm almost exactly halfway through the first edit of the last audiobook in Shadewood, having finished the recording a few weeks ago. Um, and, um, yeah, one of the things I've noticed, my camera's dropped down here, let's just nudge that over here, um, is that, um, of course, when you're writing a book, your CGI budget is, of course, totally infinite. You can, you can write anything you like. Um, and even in an audio book, your, your CGI budget is effectively still unlimited because you can just describe the, the amazing thing and let the, um, let the reader's imagination just do their thing. You know, so that's, that's really good. But of course, if you've written something which requires an astronomical CGI budget to actually realize in film, then um, <laughs> you know, you're going to have to make sure that whoever decides to make your book into a film has the necessary skills to do so. Um, the alternative, of course, is to write a story which doesn't require any CGI. So it's perfectly reasonable to write science fiction, or even fantasy, really, where um, you know, the CGI budget isn't required. So if you, you know, if you cut out things like spacecraft, um, and you cut out things like other worlds and things, and you do your sci-fi locally, um, yeah, you can probably write some quite compelling stories without all the kind of whiz bang special effects requirements. You just need to be clear what you're doing when you start. <laughs> yeah, what you're aiming for. So if I was, if I had the option of being the writer for a six million dollar movie, I would try and avoid requirements for CGI entirely. I would just basically, okay, no, I want to, I don't want to spend any money on CGI. I want to spend the money on actors and story and maybe locales that we can actually go to that look nice uh, and uh, you know etc 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 and maybe some camera effect all that kind of stuff but not the cgi because i don't think with a limited budget you can make your cgi look good 
<laughs> just don't think you can yet. <laughs> um, so um, so that's good. And, and, and even sets, if you need to build a lot of sets, you know, you, 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 you can't, you can't, you can't do that on a, on a, on a, 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 a small budget. Um, you know, unless you've got, a, a, you know, access to a motion cap studio and all those kind of things. Um, now that will change over time as technology improves and the cost comes down, but not yet. <laughs> so, um, how are the waffles coming along? Um, uh, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are doing well. Um, so, um, so anyway, so it, that was <laughs> quite an interesting interaction, but it has given me thought because, you know, um, it's, it's a worthwhile thought. I think if you're creating a story, um, I mean, I never, I've not written anything yet that I've gone, yes, this is designed to be turned into a TV series, or this is designed to be a film. I haven't written anything like that deliberately. All of my books, shall we say, have been designed to be books. Um, I gave no thought into Shadewood, uh, for example, as to whether or not it would be, um, it could be turned into a film or a TV series. No consideration whatsoever. So, um, in order to make a TV series or a film out of that, you'd have to start from kind of almost first principles, then start write a screenplay and you know figure out how you're going to do the colours and the graphics and the you know the environments and all that sort of stuff. And it, to be honest, Shadewood I think would need quite a lot of CGI because. Where's the nearest tidally locked exoplanet you can think of to film on, right? You know, so <laughs> it'd be quite difficult. Um, and books are always better. And you're quite right, um, Dr. Quest. Yes, books are always better anyway. Uh, and I do always recommend, uh, and it's old advice, but it's good advice, um, that um, if you're going to watch a film of something, go and read the book first, if you can. Um, because... Um, you know, particularly if it was, well, okay, a little, actually Wintermute might already be commenting on this. He, he, so he said not always. Now, if if it's a novelization of the film, no, okay? The, uh, the, I'm gonna modify that advice I've just given, okay? Most of the time, read the book first because the book is the original item, okay? And then the film is made about the book. So let's take Lord of the Rings, okay? Written in the 40s and 50s, not filmed properly. I know there's some other versions, but technically not filmed properly until the 21st century, okay? Um, read the books first, then go and enjoy the film because you'll get, you'll get an awful lot out of it. But it's important, I think, to, if you've got the book as the original subject matter, to get your imagination to do its thing. And you imagine the environment. You get a feel for what it looks like. You get a feel for how it feels, all those kind of things. From the vision of the writer who first put it together, okay? So Tolkien wrote it, we read it. Um, from his description, from his craft of writing, we get the visualization of the worlds in our heads. Okay, now a film is a lovely thing, and I've got nothing against film, but a film is a version of the book by somebody. Okay, okay, so somebody somewhere sat down with a group of people, probably, and said, "This is how it's going to look." Okay, now they might be really good at that, and they might, or they might not. So some film conversions of books are really, really good. Now I happen to rather like Lord of the Rings, the um, um, you yeah, know the film um, uh, that was done, um, but yeah they did change quite a lot of the story, um, but I did feel they captured the essence of how Lord of the Rings was supposed to feel. So I personally felt they did a pretty good job. But there have been film conversions where I've gone, what did you do? That's not not what happens in the book so you know I'm looking forward with some trepidation to the new Dune movie that's coming because Dune is again another one that I read as a book I read it really really early on um, and I understand the foundations Asimov foundations is being done as well so you know again that's going to be an interesting one to see how what take they they put on it um, to flip that around um, the uh, you know if if the film is the first thing, um, and then someone decides to novelise it, then watch the film first. Yeah, I, I think it's a good piece of advice generally to watch or read whatever it is, whatever the creative thing is, um, in its original first medium. So if that medium is book, read it as a book. If that first medium is film, watch it as a film. If that first medium is audio. What, listen to it in audio because that's the original creation that's that's where whatever it is stemmed from so um, so there we go um a book has 300 pages of content and the film is a 40 page i think that yeah that sort of analogy kind of works it depends you know the nice thing about a film is it does some of the heavy lifting for you, you don't have to imagine things you just have to absorb whereas reading is a little bit more 
um, dare I say it, intellectual, because you have to think a little bit about what the writer is talking about. You have to read the descriptions and then picture those in your head. So you actually are taking part as you read a book, whereas in a film you're quite passive. Uh, although you obviously be, probably be thinking about the plot and where it's going and stuff, and admiring it. Um, it's a different type of interaction. And I, I've, I've noticed it even with um, um, listening to the audio books of my own work, particularly when I haven't done the audio book. Um, so for example, take my Elite Reclamation novel from several years ago. You know, I wrote that. I know what the story is. But when you listen to it as an audio book and somebody else is reading it, in this case it was... Um, oh, gosh. Um... <laughs> Her brain. Um, anyway, jolly good chap. What's his name? I can picture him, but I can't remember his name. Um, anyway, um, the um, the um, <laughs> guy who did my book, <laughs> um, and um, you know he do, he reads it in a very very interesting style, very very good style, much better at voices and all that sort of stuff because he's a voice actor, um, and um, but. It's like listening almost to a different story. So the medium does change the the thing, okay? The the creative stuff. So that 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 is that is something that definitely happens. Um, so you know, those sort of things are, um, um, you know, they, they they alter the thing that you're listening to. So um, be sort of be mindful, I suppose, that the medium in which you consume the content actually does have an impact on the content, which is a bit weird. Um, uh, come on, sir. I write law and galactic bar on an R. Okay, so yeah, all those sort of things are good. So well done. Um, not sure if this is waffle or topic. No, no, we're still waffling. <laughs> I can guarantee we're still waffling. So the initial waffle is don't be technical. Uh, then we got got on to the yeah, last week's topic about the thing and you know, all that sort of stuff. The, the film, the, the 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 dreadful film that was going on, which turned out to be um, not quite so dreadful in hindsight once I'd figured out which order I was supposed to watch in. Um, I haven't watched the third totally unrelated film yet, so that's still on the list of things to do. We'll, we'll do that at some point. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so there we go. <laughs> How are we all anyway? So it's good to see everybody. Um, with Foundation, they're probably going to include the sequels and prequels and three additional books. I have no idea what they're going to do with um, with Foundation. It's just one of those things I get a bit nervous about. Now, Lord of the Rings, to be honest, I was, I was um, um, nervous about as well. I thought, filming Lord of the Rings really... Um, but um, I was pleasantly surprised by how well Lord of the Rings came out, um, and it captured the essence of the books for me. It felt it felt right. It felt like we were there in Middle Earth, and it was kind of how I expected it to look. Toby Longworth, there we are. <laughs> Poor old Toby Longworth. It's been a long time actually since I did that. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, the old the old grey cells. Um, uh, <laughs> now we're waffling about waffle. This is big waffle, big waffle. Um, Commander O'Connor says, speaking from the point of view of a cameraman, a film written for the screen is far easier to deal with than a film adapted from a book if the author is still alive and insists on being on the set. <laughs> I would probably be your worst nightmare then. Um, and I think that's the thing, because I think if... Yeah, that's a very astute observation, actually, Commander O'Connor there. Um, a film written for... A, I'm going to read that out again, because that's actually... That's very astute observation. Um, a film written for the screen is far easier to deal with than a film adapted from a book. And it's almost in brackets, especially if <laughs> the author is still alive and insists on being on the set for filming. So I must admit that that, that's, that, that, that jangles with me a little bit, that one, because I must admit, I think if I, if I was in the position where somebody said, right, we're going to turn Shane into a TV series, I sure as hell would want to be there. <laughs> make sure it was done properly. And I can see myself being really, 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 really annoying to everybody involved. <laughs> so I wonder how well that would work or whether actually Shane would be, you'd have to adapt it into a screenplay um, kind of based on. And you know, that that to us as consumers of, of creative things, you know, when you see, um, when you see the film start with based on the novel by, and then da-da-da-da-da, whoever it happens to be. As a writer, that always makes me go, what do you mean, what do you mean based on? <laughs> I, don't like, I don't like based on. I want to see the actual novel. That's what I'm, that's what I'm here. You know, the film should be true to the book. You know, <laughs> it should be true to the book. And of course it can't be. 
okay? Because, okay, so here's, you know, and, and the, one of the reasons for this is simply length, okay? Shade wood, right? A single shade wood book, right? One of four, okay? Um, takes 12 hours to read, okay? 12 hours to read. Um, a typical TV series, a season, is 12 hours long, okay? It's a series of one hour episodes. So unless you're gonna do a season per book, which would probably be a bit thin, um, you've, got to, you've got to compress it, okay? You've got to compress it. That automatically changes the entire nature of the story. Um, and so I can completely get why you can't just take a book and film it. You just can't do that. Um, you have to adapt it for the medium. And that will inevitably mean some compromises. And it may be big compromises, like, um, for example, in Shadewood, I would maybe have to collapse some of the characters into a single character just to allow the story to move on so you haven't got a cast of too many people. Now, when you're writing a book, it doesn't matter, okay? But when you're making a film, it does, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, I've never tried writing a screenplay. I've ne I don't even know where I'd start. I don't even know, I don't even know what the... Um, the format is, you know, because you know you have all the indents and the characters and then cut to and all this. I, d I don't know anything about that. Um, you know, so all that would be a mystery to me. So I, I know nothing about screenwriting. Um, so I think, um, you know, so TV series have a major advantage in adapting books to screen, I think now. I tried, uh, Alan says, I tried writing a play based on the short story and I had to take a very different approach. Just setting the story on the stage didn't work. Yeah, you see, and that's the thing is, um, the me, I, th I think it's the, the bottom line there is the medium in which you are now working alters the creative zone, whatever we want to call it, in which the work exists and it modifies it inevitably. Um, uh, that's why Crichton wrote Jurassic Park's movie script. Okay, so that's good. Um, 12 hours to read a book, it takes me months. <laughs> it depends on how much time you're doing it. You know, elapsed time, I suppose, is different to actual reading time. Um, so, um, so there we go. Um, Commander O'Connor goes thirteen hours plus recaps. You know, so that's 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 it. Um, very very complicated. Um, you're not going to do one yet, but you're going to. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and you, and I think it would make sense to me if you want to have something adapted to be a screenplay. Actually, you'd start with start with a screenplay. Okay, come up with an idea and see if you can write. Uh, and I suppose it's like anything else. You'd have to practice at writing the screenplay and getting good at writing screenplays. Um, now I've got a fair bit of experience in writing books and I know um, yeah, there's a lot of not quite so obvious things that you need to do when you're writing a book that aren't, you know, don't jump out straight away. It's not a case of just sitting down at a machine and coming up with a story. You know, you have to have pacing, you have to have description, you have to have beats and you have to have scenes and you have to have emotional arcs and you have to have resolutions and climaxes and, you know, you know, denouements and, you know, points of despair and all those sort of things that go into making a novel interesting to read. Um, now there must be, I'm assuming, structures to a screenplay which work. Okay, you need to have acts and you need to have scenes within those acts and you kind of need to have a, you know, something that rolls. And if you're doing a multi-part, like, like I say, a TV series screenplay, presumably you have to have enough things that carry over, but each individual episode needs to make sense in itself. Um, to, a, to a level, you know, I, and I don't know, I don't know what those techniques are. Um, um, so there we go. Um, 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 we must cultivate a sophisticated imagination. We must indeed, yes, we must, that's very good. Start with a radio play. Yeah, so that's that's a good suggestion. Um, I must admit, I've, I've, <laughs> I've never tried, I've never tried. Um, uh, and also screenplays have multiple writers, so yes, yeah, so all those sort of things are important. Um, Glenn says formatting and abbreviations in screenplay also. So uh, I must admit, I don't know anything about those. So I'd have to, I'd have to learn that, you know. Um, so uh, yeah, in, in uh, the thing. So um, so interesting to see. Um, anyway, so <laughs> that's the waffle. <laughs> Um, and as ever, you know, if you've got writing questions, now I'm, I'm no guru, okay, I'm no guru on anything. Um, what I have done, however, is written several books um, and got them published and so on and so forth. Um, so um, happy to, you know, answer any questions that people want to chuck in the chat and I'll do my best. Um, otherwise, it's just kind of a free for all kind of discussion. Now we do have a topic and I will turn this to the topic. Now to tonight's topic is actually 
both a sort of science fiction and a sort of fantasy topic really um, and it's it's the subject of of parallel worlds now I was playing around that that's partly why I went for um, um, Doctor Who now I know Doctor Who is mostly known for uh, time travel clearly um, but I was I was intrigued by the possibilities of of um, alternate realities and um, you know, another trope that's used quite a lot in fantasy and science fiction, sometimes to solve problems, sometimes to deal, deal with issues, and sometimes just to explore how things might have been if they were subtly different. Um, so uh, Glenzo has only watched a few video, YouTube videos about screenplay writing, uh, but there's a lot to learn. Yeah, so I haven't even, I haven't even started that. Um, so, um, so there we go. Funny you should mention alternate realities, says Aegon V. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, interesting enough, um, my uh, the chat on the screen is working um, better than the chat on my. Um, I don't, okay, I don't, it's a technical thing. Um, uh, on my OBS, this chat is lagging behind a bit, whereas on the screen, it actually <laughs> seems to be in sync, which is uh, technology. Never understood it. Um, so books and stories are supposed to be one plot from the beginning to end, right? And I've been working, worried about the pacing of my main story for a while because I don't know if it's slow paced or not. Um, the only way really to assess that, Bilbo Gavins, is to get some beta readers. Um, and we've talked about this a bit on the stream before, is don't ask family and friends to critique your work, okay? When, you're, when you at least are happy that it kind of makes sense from beginning to end, or you've got something that re you think is reasonably readable, that's the time to find some people who are happy to re, you know, read it through and give you some honest feedback. Generally, the, the advice is don't use family and friends because they, they'll all go, it's lovely, it's really good, well done, <laughs> which is not what you need, okay? You need someone to go, mm, this bit here, it's, it's, it's rubbish, you need to read like that. This bit here, to be honest, I fell asleep, you know, or I skipped it because it was really boring. Um, I like this character, you should do more of them. You know, that's the sort of feedback you actually need. And friends and family, generally and then you may have a family actually who basically doesn't mind insulting you instead telling you stuff's crap but um, in general terms family and friends are usually a bit uncomfortable with giving you actual honest feedback about this whole writing thing so if you can find a writing club or some people who yeah, there are some online stuff they can do as well um, you know who will give you yeah, actual criticism that that can be a valuable thing um, parallel worlds as in multiverses yes yeah, so we'll get on to multiverses as well um, so, um, so, uh, so, yeah, the, rea <laughs> the reality where I'm which wouldn't it be nice? I think there needs to be a reality where all of us are rich. Um, so, Alan, Alan, yeah, Alan's lucky there, and so am I actually. I've got a wife who likes to read my stuff and actually will basically say, "No, oh, what the hell are you doing here? This is rubbish." Um, so, um, so, you yeah, know, so that is uh, sometimes it definitely can work, but as a general rule. Um, it's best to avoid friends and family unless they're specifically absolutely interested and, and they will give you you know good honest feedback um, so um, so there we go so my wife is good to critique for grammar but not so much for plot and other things so it depends on the person this is going to depend quite a bit on the person um, so yeah so um, lucky Luigi I've just finished Katie Max the end of everything one theory is that everything that can happen um, uh, including the universe ending right now <laughs> Let's hope not. I'm in the middle of a stream, that would be very embarrassing. Um, it's happening all the time at once. We just happen to be in the parallel universe that did not end. So, so you know, this parallel universe. So let's go back to the beginning of of, of um, uh, freaky deaky dude criticism. We're not allowed to criticise people. Is that uh, that that could be a whole another waffle? Maybe I should do a stream on things that I don't like about the modern world. <laughs> I've encountered it this. Okay, a smaller side. I've encountered it this week. Um, a number of times on my Twitter feed, uh, and I've tried not to argue with people because it's just not worth it to be honest. Um, <laughs> people seem to be unable to cope nowadays with the fact that people can hold nuanced opinions. Um, you know, I can, I can both. I can, yeah. Let's let's take the obvious example. I can take the opinion that actually um, there are things wrong with certain computer games that. <laughs> I, I have played in the past, and um, yeah, that's that's bad. <laughs> and I can also hold the opinion that actually people are working on this and trying to fix it. That's good. So things are good and bad. Okay, there's a mix of views, and as an individual person, I can hold multiple views at once. <laughs> people seem very, 
<laughs> people seem unable to cope with this phenomenon, uh, which I don't know, it seems to be a modern affliction. You, you must be in this camp or you must be in that camp. But what happens if I'm in both camps? I, in fact, agree with both of you. I think you've both got a good point. Um, and maybe the truth is one or the other. Who knows? Um, <laughs> It's like, no, that's not acceptable nowadays. If you're not with me, you're against me. So then that's not how it works. <laughs> I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's society or something like that. Anyway, I, yeah, we mustn't get distracted. But that, that's worth a stream on its own, you know, this whole um, thing. I've come, I'm, I'm rapidly coming to the conclusion, actually, that the problem nowadays actually isn't all the people, it's all the categories we've invented. I, I think I've talked about categories before because the moment you invent a category, you have to put things in that category and therefore by definition, some things are no longer in that category. Uh, and then <laughs> then you've got a boundary between people and that, that seems to be the problem. Um, so, uh, so, <laughs> uh, dear. Um, so um, how about all the, I mean, yeah, actually, Glenn, that's a very good point. And, 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 and small plug again for Nine Streams of Consciousness. Very subtle there, very good. Um, you know, we did get to a point where we had enough trust on our stream that we could critique each other's work quite openly and nobody would take any offence. It was like, wow, what, what an achievement. Um, but, you know, taking, taking the time to learn to trust each other, particularly through the medium of the internet, which isn't actually great particularly in text form only, to establish that trust and understanding and knowledge of each other and to know when somebody's pulling your leg and all that kind of stuff. Um, because people can interpret things in text very, very differently to how um, you maybe intended it to come out. And some people can be really, really literal. <laughs> and so as a writer, you have to be incredibly careful to make sure the meaning that you intend to convey is actually the one that comes out of the text. And you can't guarantee that the person reading it's going to pick that meaning up anyway. So text is a very, very inefficient um, and easily misunderstood method of communication, particularly over something that is potentially slightly controversial. So most of the arguments you see, I'm pretty sure, are down to that problem. <laughs> but what can we do? You try. Um, Famous true expression, we mustn't get distracted. OK, so we're talking about parallel worlds. Now, this is interesting. OK, so parallel worlds. Um, now, I quite like, you know, so quite often parallel worlds come up in the concept of time travel. So let's let's um, um, let's talk about time travel briefly in this context. So the idea that, you know, this is this is the classic grandfather paradox. OK, so my grandfather was born in 1912. He died in 1985. Um, um, but obviously, um, he's, he's my ancestor, OK? So if I go back in time, you know, from the year 2021, I assume I've got a working time machine, uh, uh, and I go back in time to somewhere between 1912 and 1985, or actually before my parents were born, which would have been 19, late, late, uh, mid-1940s, OK? Let's say I go back to about 1938. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, 1939. I mean, that no major historical events were happening in 1939, so obviously I'll be completely safe. <laughs> um, but around that era, let's say I, I sneak back in time and I kill my grandfather because I'm stupid, okay? Then we immediately have what's called the grandfather paradox, which basically is, if, okay, if my grandfather is dead, then, you know, he can't um, marry my grandmother uh, my parent, my mother in this case, of this side of the family I'm thinking of, um, is never born. Therefore, how can I possibly be born? OK, um, and then that it doesn't resolve itself, because if I'm not born, um, how is it that I exist in order to go back in time to kill my grandfather in the first place? And, you know, this is one of the early classic problems with time travel is effectively you, you either if you can um, affect something, then you potentially can wipe yourself out of existence. <laughs> or something. And it doesn't really make a great deal of sense. Um, and this, you know, has, has been done in quite a few science fiction. I mean, a classic one, obviously, is Back to the Future um, with Marty McFly and the DeLorean time machine, where he goes back to 1955 and accidentally falls in Well, he makes his mum accidentally fall in love with him so she doesn't fall in love with his father um, and slowly erases himself from existence. And he basically has a photograph which slowly erases. It's, I mean, it's funny, but it's a silly plot device because it's basically you know, at any stage, there's a, there's a, there's a, the, the photograph has half, half of people erased. And it's like, well, what's that photograph taking a picture of? 
it's, it doesn't quite make sense. But it's quite a nice plot device. Um, but that doesn't really make sense, does it? Yeah, the whole grandfather paradox seems to kind of preclude going back in time and actually making meaningful alterations to yourself um, or your or history. Um, so, um, <laughs> so um, or maybe, yeah, so... Um, a bill by bank, uh, bill games. I thought of my own answer to this one. The villain tried to. St uh, oh, hang on. The script's moving. The <laughs> chat's moving so fast. Um, so um, I thought of my own answer for the grandfather paradox, but it's been these long, so I'll refrain. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so um, so yeah. So that's that's the, the classic problem. Now the other one. One of the um, uh, one of the um, resolutions to this is actually. Um, yes, you can go back in time, but whatever the events that happened um, still happen, despite the fact that you're there. So you actually become part of the events that have kind of already taken place. So even though you uh, feel like you're interfering with time and interfering with history, whatever it is that you do back in the past is actually what have happened anyway. So if your grandfather survived, no matter what you try and do, something will stop you. OK. All right. <laughs> Now, the problem with that one is if that's true, then um, you have no free will. <laughs> Something somewhere at some higher level in the in the universe has decreed what all events are throughout the entire history of time. Um, and we as individuals are just basically just actors following a script pre-programmed to do stuff. Um, <laughs> so that one's that one's kind of like, OK, that one's got some issues as well um, in terms of, OK, well, who's written the script? Why are we all here? You know, um, and, and, yeah, I don't want to get into the kind of um, <laughs> old predestination paradox. So that one's got some issues as well. Now, the other theory is that if you go back in time and murder your grandfather, you do alter history. OK, your grandfather doesn't exist. He's dead. Uh, therefore, you are never born. However, um, moving forward from that point in time, time sort of bifurcates and there are now two universes. There's the one where you come from, um, where you've gone back in time, where your grandfather did exist and give birth to your um, mother, who then obviously gives birth to you. Uh, not give birth, so that sounds a bit weird. Anyway, you know what I mean. <laughs> there's a chain of consequences. Um, and then there's the new universe in which you're now proceeding forward in, which is virtually identical, but doesn't have your grandfather in it, and therefore doesn't have your family line. So when you get to the present era that you left, you aren't there because you are the, now the old man who killed your grandfather you know many decades ago and you're just moving forward from that point you've got a parallel universe okay which is very 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 similar but you've made a change and that makes more logical consistency I think in terms of <laughs> the way time travel might work um, of course as far as we know time travel doesn't work anyway um, so that's that's where in science fiction um, you know, some of the thinking of parallel universes came to them is the fact that, you know, if you do time, try and travel back, you affect a new strand of history, which is separate from the one that you were in. And you can't actually ever then get back to the universe, if you like, that you were in, because there's no way for you to be there. Um, the, the only problem with that one is if you go back in time um, and studiously don't make any changes to the timeline, um, or you don't murder your grandfather, <laughs> Etc. 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 Then you could reasonably hope that a younger version of you, or actually the, your, yourself, um, you, you would you would therefore be able to meet, <laughs> and then maybe at that point you change into a parallel universe. I don't know. Um, so that sort of thing. Freaky Diggy Dude's talking about parallel dimensions. We'll get we'll get to parallel dimensions as well. But then in quantum mechanics, okay. And I don't want to get too. Um, two physics on you here because um, A, I don't really know my stuff that well, but I, I know of it, but I don't know it well. And there are probably some clever astrophysicists and physicists on the stream who will shoot down any, any of my <laughs> things. Uh, in the, but, you know, um, quantum mechanics does talk about quantum states and quantum possibilities and things like that. Now, there is a, a really interesting experiment, OK, called the, the double slit experiment, OK? Um, now, this may or may not have any impact on parallel universes, but bear with me for the moment, because this is how I heard it explained to me. Um, and these things are very difficult to prove. OK, so um, you basically, the, the double slit experiment is a very, very famous experiment, which explains the wave particle duality of 
of, 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 of uh, fundamental parts of the universe, okay? So the idea being, if you've got a beam of light, okay, and you shine it through a metal grating which has two parallel slits in it, okay, your, um, your intuition would tell you that you would get two kind of light sh sources on the other side and, and the rest of it would be in shadow. That's what your brain would generally tell you would be the result of shining a light, a beam of light through two two slits. Okay, you would expect to see two light bars on this. Uh, yeah, imagine a screen at the back. Okay, you'd see you'd expect to see two light bars on the back um, as a result of shining light through two slits. That's not what happens. Okay, that's not what happens. What you actually get is a sort of weird diffraction pattern of alternating light and dark coloured um, um, beams of light. You don't get two, you get you get several, okay? Then you can look this up, the double slit experiment. Now, the explanation for the behaviour of the double slit experiment is that light is a wave, okay? Um, and what's happening is that the waves are at you know, the two parallel beams of light that you've got as a result of the shining through the double slit are interacting with each other. Sometimes they're um, reinforcing each other. You know, you get a big wave. Sometimes they're cancelling each other out. You get nothing at all. So you get this pattern of light and dark shadows effectively on the on the back wall. You don't get just two beams of light. Very interesting experiment. Now, what's wackier though, okay, what's wackier about this is that if you... Um, if you shine um, a very, very sensitive light emitting device, a light emitting device that's capable of firing one photon at a time, okay, so you fire one photon at a time, one through the left hand slit and one through the right hand slit, what you would expect to see at the back there, okay? Um, uh, now you might think, okay, hang on a minute, okay, so in general terms, when you're shining a light to you, you know, billions and billions of photons are coming out all the time. So you could expect sort of stuff to go on and that's that's a wave and it's doing its thing. But this time we're just firing one photon to the left hand side and one photon to the right. What would you expect to see on the back wall? Now again, intuition would say, well, if you're firing one bit of light, one packet of light, one quanta of light at a time, okay, you know, it's just going to go straight through and then you're going to get a pile of them on one side and you'd expect to get two lines of um, uh, two lines of you know photons hitting the back wall you don't this experiment's been done even if you fire one photon at a time you still get the diffraction pattern the, the weird oscillating set of lights okay and this the, this is a very classic experiment, um, and it's worth looking up the wave wave particle duality and the double slit experiment. Okay, because it's it's absolutely fascinating. Now the question is, if you're if you're firing a single, um, you know, photon at a time, what the hell is it interacting with in order to make the diffraction pattern at the back? Because it's all very well thinking about it from a wave perspective. Okay. Um, <laughs> because you can kind of, yeah, okay, well, the waves are interaction and do stuff. But if you're only sending one bit at a time, um, then then it's like, eh, <laughs> what's it interacting with? Now, one of the most wackiest explanations of why you still get um, the diffraction pattern at the back is that um, the photon that you fire is interacting with a photon in the parallel universe. <laughs> maybe, maybe there are an infinite number of universes and in many many of those universes somebody is doing the same double slit experiment that you are at the same time i'm not sure if that stacks up to any reasonable thinking but it made me think okay you know so this this, <laughs> this whole parallel universe um um, so luckily we just said that's the photons following every possible path at once interfering with itself. So this whole wave particle duality thing is very, very, very non-intuitive. It's, it's, a, it's a fundamental mystery at the, at, the, at the kind of heart of the universe as to how this stuff actually works. Um, it's, it's very weird. Um, but one of the explanations is, and one of the, it's, to be honest, it's one of the more esoteric uh, explanations, is that there are effectively an infinity of parallel universes where every quantum possibility is played out. Um, and somehow these universes sort of coexist in the same physical space, but are separate to each other, so we can't actually see them. Um, and, you know, in science fiction and fantasy, it's usually talked about as, you know, some big event, you know, and there are several films basically like, um, you know, you get into the elevator 
Um, actually, there's a classic one where there's a, there's a lady who basically just misses getting on an underground train uh, in one reality. And in another reality, she does get onto the underground train and, and the film explores how her life is different in both situations. Now, you know, human conceit basically requires you know us to think well obviously um, it's only our decisions that make these different universes so do I get up in the morning do I not get up in the morning boom two universes okay uh, do I have cornflakes do I have toast uh, two universes boom you know, one universe where I had cornflakes one universe where I had toast um, you can see that even just at a human level right um, the number of universes that you would <laughs> You would start to have would be pretty significant pretty quickly okay <laughs> I mean there are how many billion people are there on the earth you know I don't know four billion people now I'm not sure what it is um, you know if everyone <laughs> if a new if a new quantum universe is being created every time somebody makes a decision about what to have for breakfast we're gonna have billions and billions of universes pretty quickly and then and then there's all the variations of all those billion billion universes you're quickly gonna get to a very unsustainable number or a very large number anyway something to the power of several somethings um, sliding doors there we go Alan says sliding doors so sliding doors is an interesting film okay um, it's not it's kind of a parallel universe film I suppose but it's basically the you know what if you know if, basically if I on on this day I catch the train um, in a parallel universe I don't catch the train how does my life change and it's it, you know it's quite that's quite an interesting premise and that's basically as far as the science goes in that one it's not really a sci-fi film um, but if you start thinking about the possibility of parallel universe, just from a human perspective, okay, so, um, um, you know, the number of universes you potentially require is, 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 is huge almost straight away. Um, freaky dickies in the universe, <laughs> the Weetabix universe. Um, so, um, um, a Vic Free says, okay, so um, uh, just put quantum in front of everything, that'll do the trick. Yeah, it's a... <laughs> I think we've said that on this stream before. Make things sound cool. Just put quantum because um, qu qu quantum population is almost eight billion now. Is it? I mean, I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure it's barely over a couple of billion when I was a kid. It's really going up, isn't it? Um, Vic Free says, Drew. The really weird part is if you put the observer on one slit, even if it doesn't activate, i.e., it went through the other slit, the band disappears and you get two groups. So there's 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 lots of weird stuff that we. I mean, I don't understand, but I think some of the physicists are wrestling with this sort of stuff. But, you know, in the parallel universe thing, just at a human level, the number of universes you need are... Um, uh, <laughs> Fox site says, indecisive people are a menace to a quantum realm, yeah. Shall I exist in this universe? And, you know, um, so, and, and I suppose it begs the question of, okay, well, if I make a choice, then, yeah, and you make a choice, and everybody else makes a choice, and then I make another choice, um, it seems a very expensive way <laughs> Of dealing with all the possibilities and that's just at a human level okay so what about all the animals and what about all the plants and yeah you know, anything that's capable of making a decision right down to the quantum level of particles interacting or choosing not to interact or just yeah you know, whatever you know if every possible quantum fluctuation is you know potentially mirrored so that every conceivable configuration of matter is you know is is played out in all possibilities the number of universes you have is way way bigger numerically than the number of actual particles there are in any individual universe okay so you're talking about a very 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 large number i've got no idea what number that is um, but it's an unfeasibly large number <laughs> um uh, Alan says, okay, so there you go. Uh, Alan form says, life forming by chance is very unlikely, so you need lots of universes to make it possible. So, yeah, so is that, there's a thing, um, you know, there we can go. Um, uh, Glenn's just finished a book called Quantum Arrow, which deals with parallel universes that are in different time events. So, you know, so that's the thing, you know, we're in, you know, and the nature of existence is, is, is a difficult thing to quantify, as, as we've already discussed in the past. But, you know, I, I quite like the idea that there's a parallel universe where every decision that I've made that's significant in my life. There's an alternative version of me traveling around the universe somewhere um, who made a different choice. Okay, now that's a really powerful writing tool. So I mean, take some significant events in your life um, and basically change them around. So, you know, for example, um, you know, the classic one is, um, you know, if, if I had 
failed my certain examinations, I wouldn't have gone to university. If I hadn't gone to university, I wouldn't have met my wife. Um, so how would my life be different? I mean, I, I, you know, all the events post that point would be entirely different from my perspective. Would that have made a dramatic impact on the overall timeline of the universe? I suspect it probably wouldn't. I'm not that significant a person. Um, but who knows? I don't know, right? Um, <laughs> interviewed in an alternative universe, Odyssey is bug free. No, we're only, we're only dealing with realistic alternative universes here, we're <laughs> Um, and so Alan says it's been proposed that the number of parallel universes effectively infinite. I, I don't think it, it needs to be in absolutely infinite because presumably there's only a finite number of combinations of matter in the in the universe. Uh, but that number is literally astronomical. <laughs> um, you may have met when you offered a prize with that. I mean, maybe. Um, and you know, so this this is this is another thing about the existence. You know, are certain events supposed to happen, or is it just pure chance, or you know? And um, so is there, a, is there another universe in which my life played out in a very different way? Um, you know, I was involved in a, you know, quite nasty car crash um, many, many years ago, you know, uh, which has had an impact on me since. Uh, now, would my life have been different if I hadn't had that car crash? Um, you know, <laughs> I don't know. You know, so all those possibilities are there. You know, what's the parallel me? What status is he in? Um, you know, there are presumably some parallel universes where I'm I'm dead, okay, <laughs> because some other bad thing happened that I don't know about that I managed to avoid in this universe. Whereby in that universe, if all possibilities are played out, there are several universes out there where I do not exist. Um, but there, conversely, there are possibly lots and lots of other universes. And statistically, I mean, I don't know if I'm I'm a I'm a good Drew or a bad Drew or an unlucky Drew or a lucky Drew uh, on on average because I've got only this sample to, to deal with. Maybe there are many there's some universes out there where I'm doing spectacularly well, <laughs> you know, and I'm I'm basically overlord of the entire galaxy by this point. I mean, <laughs> who knows? I <laughs> quite like the idea that um, you know, and, and you know, just yeah, you know, being totally selfish about concentrating on my universes. I I was born in 1970, so anything before that I'm not interested in. Only universes that exist from 1970 onward, um, you know, where where things that happen to me have bifurcated into all the universe possibilities. And there's, there's obviously presumably quite a lot of them. Um, yeah, for all the significant events that happen to me in my life, what happens uh, to me and in general the world? Actually, yeah, you know, I'd probably be interested in that if I chose a different path at that point in time. Um, and I suppose for science fiction mostly, probably less for fantasy, but mostly for science fiction, the idea of travelling to those other realities is is maybe the compelling story point. You know, okay, I'm going to transfer to the other universe and find out how I'm doing and see if I can find a universe where I'm doing substantially better than I am now. What what happened? <laughs> what did he do? Um, um, and can I bump him off? <laughs> And take his place, etc., etc., etc. So, um, um, so yeah. So, and, and and people will probably. Uh, I think Alan's mentioned it. Some parts of my life have turned on very narrow events. So I think, uh, <laughs> Brad, UK seventy four. Does anyone in the stream from the future please raise your hand? <laughs> um, yeah, and Glenn's saying that if I had not lost my job and had to change to another company, I'd like would never met my wife. So there are events like that which fundamentally change your life. The fact that you know you you end up with a partner who you spend the rest of your life with and you fall in love and all those kind of things, then that's a, that's a major event in anybody's life, okay? And if that combination of events had not happened, and it is total chance, or at least it appears to be total chance, um, you know, depending on your beliefs and things, um, you know, some people will see divine guidance in those things, and that's, you know, can't disprove that. Uh, so, um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> elite Dangerous Odyssey one. We must, we must stop being mean to Elite Dangerous Odyssey. I think I think we've kind of we've stirred that spoon about enough. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and Asimov's The End of Eternity deals with modifying the passage of time. Now I think that would be a very dangerous thing to do, but I do like the idea of, of parallel worlds from a sci-fi perspective. Um, and of course then comes the question from the science fiction novel, is, do, is there technology to allow you to traverse between these worlds? Now lots of um, shows and books and films have touched upon this. Um, Star Trek is particularly 
fond of parallel universes. Um, um, you know, one of the favourite ones I have, of course, the um, the mirror mirror, where they go into a kind of evil version of, of themselves, where the you know, the federation has been replaced with an evil empire, and and everybody's attitudes are different. So, I mean, that would be a fantastic universe to to visit, <laughs> find out what the evil you was doing. Um, and I would obviously have to have a goatee beard uh, <laughs> and a very stern look. You're messing with Drew. <laughs> Not sure if I'd be a very good baddie, um, but. Um, um, yeah, that's that's an interesting take. Okay, we're in a parallel universe uh, where most of the technology is the same, most of the stuff is the same, most of the people are the same, but all the attitudes are changed. So that's that's an interesting thing, and yet somehow the two histories manage to stay in some sort of sync. Yeah, which is weird because if everybody's attitudes are different, everybody's decisions should be different. You would expect the universes to diverge rather quickly and different things to happen, but it seems that major events kept those universes in sync, which is just a feature of how Star Trek looked at it. Um, you know, Evil Kirk and Spock were great, you know, so all that sort of stuff. Um, evil Drew with a beard and no hat. <laughs> um, but what Gavin says, let's just say for a moment that the observable universe is the entire universe. That would mean the amount of alternative universes with the amount of atoms factorial. Okay, so he's actually written this down, which is 10 to the 10 to the 81 number of universes that's the bare minimum sorry for these mentions I'll try. now that's really good Bill Bergman. I mean, so that's that's actually a number that we can at least write down even though I've got no concept of how big that is it's 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 81 um, that's a lot <laughs> um, and TNG had a good one where the Federation ended up losing the war against the Klingons so yes there's a there's a um, that's a sort of time travel one I think which is yesterday's Enterprise if I'm remembering correctly where the Enterprise encounters a ship from the past, the Enterprise C, which alters the timeline of the current Enterprise um, in such a way um, that they're kind of in a parallel universe, but it's it's more framed as a time thing. Anyway, something like that, that's what I'm thinking of. Um, and the mirror universe is consistent in several Star Trek series. So that's that's clever, isn't it? Um, and Avengers Infinity War. Yeah, so, you know, there's good stuff. It's a, it's a very constant theme that comes back. And I think it, as a writing tool, it appeals because we're always, as human beings, tantalised with the oh, what if, particularly if you've just made a mistake <laughs> or something's gone wrong, you know. Wow, yeah, what if I hadn't gone there today or I hadn't driven down that road today or I hadn't had that conversation today or, you know, all those kind of what if scenarios. Would things be better if I didn't do this or didn't do that or hadn't done that back then? All those sorts of things. Um, it's 19 zeros less than a Googleplex. Okay. <laughs> so it's smaller than the Googleplex. Okay, there we go. So that's interesting. You know, so those those are um um that's why I think it appeals because there's um there's the sort of almost romance of okay, well is there a version of me out there somewhere in the multiverse which um who's doing better than I am? I mean, even um even Red Dwarf touched upon this, didn't it? With I mean, I know Red Dwarf isn't exactly the uh, um, you know the most serious of science fiction, but it is actually quite good science fiction in places, and it touches on some quite fundamental things, you know, too, yeah, really, really well. And it it does this, yeah. You know, it has um, it has you know the classic Rimmer, who's obviously the yeah you know, the the serial loser of of the, of the Red Dwarf crew, but he encounters Ace Rimmer, who's his counterpart, who's just basically perfect. <laughs> In every possible way, he's just he's just the you know the gallant hero and gets all the girls and and just is is literally brilliant. Um, and of course they they meet. So there's this loser Rimmer who meets his counterpart from a parallel universe, who is um, <laughs> is basically perfect. And it's just it, you know it's it's good comedy. Um, but it's it's parallel universes again. Um, um, so you know so that that's quite good. Um, and um, you yeah, know so that that's the thing. And in um, um, yeah, there's there's plenty of TV shows that kind of use that 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 theme, um, you know, for for, for, for for dramatic purposes. That whole what if scenario um, of you know possibilities that may have occurred. Uh, there's a universe where I never wrote shape. I know. I mean, how 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 sad. <laughs> so, <laughs> smoke me a kipper, skipper. I'll be back for breakfast. Yes, you watch that episode too. Uh, Wintermute says, yesterday's Enterprise early, one of the best TNG episodes. It was. It's a really good one. One of the best Star Trek episodes. Um, so, you know, so it's it's something that's used quite a lot. 
Um, and it's also used in fantasy. I mean, the one that springs to mind is um, uh, Michael Moorcock with the, um, um, you know, the Hawk Moon stuff and Tanny Lawn and all those kind of things, um, where, you know, the whole concept of those series of books is that there is a multiverse um, that is connected by some artifacts in diversity, and the artifacts can take different forms depending on which universe they're in. So there's a, there's a multiverse where... Um, things are quite recognisably similar to what we would consider sort of normal, and then there's weird. I mean, Michael Moorcock must have been on some some stuff because I mean, some of his descriptions. I mean, they're 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 really good, but they're they're really weird as well. <laughs> um, so if you've ever read my, some of Michael Moorcock stuff, um, um, that is a real fantasy multiverse type construct it's it's really quite fascinating what he's done there it's very very deep and very very convoluted at times it's quite hard to read because you're trying to f figure out what the heck's going on um, and only when certain artifacts impinge on certain multiverses do they instantiate into artifacts that you can actually recognize and the characters can deal with it's, it's most peculiar um, so um, so uh, so those those things are um, you know are done in fantasy as well the idea that there are multiple universes and then there's sometimes a way to cut across between them. And another one, obviously, um, uh, relatively recently, um, uh, His Dark Materials on TV, I'm watching at the moment, which is based on some books by Philip Pullman. There's another multiverse thing where things are quite similar between universes, but subtly change. So, you know, we have a universe where, you know, when we start off watching that, where Oxford University still exists, and you think, well, this seems perfectly normal. And then there's some airships, and you go, well, that's that's a bit odd. And then all the people have these demons or daemons um, connected to them as their sort of souls, which is a bit weird. Um, you know, again, um, you know, and then there's, you know, it's a parallel universe. So, you know, it's a very, very common, very, very powerful writing trope. Um, uh, Casper24, did we already mention Rick and Morty regarding multiverses and travel? Yeah. <laughs> Rick and Morty is something that I keep getting recommended to watch. I haven't watched much of it yet. My son's really into it. I need to spend some time catching up on that. Um, so you know, so um, that that's quite that's quite important. Um, um, I love the way that Lister becomes eternal using the paradox of placing himself under the pool table. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. So actually, the good thing about Red Dwarf is for those of us who love science fiction, most of the most of the the really good tropes are lampooned really really well in Red Dwarf so you know the whole um, um, yeah even Star Trek gets lampooned once there's this lovely line basically where Crichton is talking to Lister Crichton is the mechanoid he's an android trying to kind of be human he's a, he's a bit like Data but you know um, rather inept um, and he's you know, <laughs> basically talks to Lister is um, is this is this the human value you call friendship Lister sort of slaps him around the head and says, "Stop with the Star Trek crap! It's too early in the morning. <laughs> it's just, it's just brilliant." Um, and yeah, the intertextuality there is very, very good. It's very, very good. Um, so Rick and Morty, yes, I need to get into Rick and Morty. It's, it's on my list. Um, so um, catching up the channel again. Okay, not just artifacts, but charities. They all, they're all aspects of the Eternal Champion. So yeah, Wintermute's quite right. So if you haven't read Michael Moorcock. Um, dig that out. It's relatively old now. I, mean, I, don't, I assume Michael Moorcock's dead. I must admit. I don't know. Um, does anybody know? I assume he is. Um, I'm going to quickly look him up. Hang on a minute. Um, I mean, he was old when I was reading when I was a teenager. So, um, oh no, he's still no, he's still going. He's still alive. Michael Moorcock's still with us. Excellent. He's 81. Okay, so uh, there we go. He's still here. <laughs> Sorry, Michael Moorcock, didn't mean to <laughs> prematurely put you in your grave, apologies. Um, no, he's still about. So, um, yeah, so his, his fantasy novels are based all based around the entire set, okay, and they're not all kind of directly connected to each other, but they're all set in this multiverse. They're very, very complicated and weird. He basically, um, there's some interesting interviews with Michael Moorcock when he talks about... Um, uh, Tolkien and things like that. He basically says, "Oh yeah, Tolkien, very pedestrian, no imagination at all." It's kind of like, okay. <laughs> and you know, he doesn't like. He really didn't like the formulaic kind of um, 
you know, good guys go on a quest to against impossible odds to defeat the evil bad dude. Okay, he he hated that sort of um, formulaic quest. So he had, you know, he had a, he didn't have much of an opinion of Tolkien's work. Um, and um, you know, so he wrote something very, very different. Um, is, is there a universe where Michael Walcock is all dead already? Yes, there probably is. <laughs> um, so check out Michael Walcock's work. Um, as an intro, I would recommend um, the History of the Rune Staff series, which is probably a little bit more generally accessible to. Um, to, to readers than some of the other stuff. And if you like that, then you can kind of graduate onto his more wacky stuff. Um, so, um, you know, so he's, he's definitely worth checking out. I really liked the History of the Rune Staff series, which is late 60s going into the 70s, I think. Um, it's sort of set in a parallel Europe. And uh, it's, 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 it's actually very clever. So worth checking out. But some of his other stuff is, is a bit more kind of like, okay, What's going on? Um, <laughs> I am confused. Um, interestingly enough, his website is multiverse.org. Um, so, um, so there we go. Um, Michael Moorcock's miscellany, um, multiverse.org. So there we go. Um, <laughs> so he's kind of a fantasy master in multiverses. Um, um, yeah, Jerry Cornelius definitely more towards the wacky, and so there's there's some very interesting weird characters, and some of them understand. Some of the characters don't understand that they're in a multiverse, and some of them do. Okay, so that gives them weird perspectives on things. Um, so, um, so yes, yeah, so that's you know. So he's he's quite a. He's not so well known today. I don't hear many people discussing Michael Moorcock as much nowadays as perhaps they did a few decades ago. Uh, but he he's definitely up there with some of the top fantasy writers of the 60s and 70s in particular, I would say. So he's definitely worth checking out. Um, uh, Oswald Bastard bought excellent steampunk before steampunk became a thing. So yeah, so there's there's some interesting stuff. Uh, and Wintermute says, Moorcock has a new Elric book out this year. I'm going to have to catch up on that. I didn't know that. Uh, and No Man's Sky has a multiverse too. I'm going to have to... Oh, I don't know that yet. So that, no spoilers for me. <laughs> it's interesting that they've done that. I mean, one of the things I will say about No Man's Sky is they've got an awful lot of sci-fi tropes in in the game you kind of think okay well, i can kind of see okay well, i can see where that's come from where that's come from and where, where the inspiration of that's come from um lots and lots of stuff like oh the, you know there's this idea from a sci-fi book around, oh yeah we'll put that in as well you know so that's <laughs> so I, i'm enjoying that about no man's sky because i'm, I'm seeing things that i recognize in a in a in a science fiction context which is really really cool uh, somebody somewhere um mentioned is um, oh, there we are, Rob's 2610, that was a little bit further up the chat, it's gone off the top of the screen, but um, can multiverse be an excuse for lazy writing sometimes and a cop out to undo something you feel is a mistake? I suppose you could, um, but I think it would be, um, it's quite a hard way to cop out really, isn't it? Because if you're, <laughs> if you're, if you're going to introduce multiverse into your novel, um, in order to undo a mistake, you're going to have to somehow get across to the reader that there's a multiverse of possibilities out there. And that's not a simple thing just to chuck into a novel, I wouldn't have thought. Um, so um, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't think I can think of any examples where multiverse has been used to, you know, as a plot device to. I mean, I suppose you could. You could just say, oh, well, you know, that version of me um, didn't succeed, therefore I'm going to restart. Uh, and I think Glenn sort of touched on it there. Any game that's single player is kind of a multiverse, right? So, yeah, so if you have a game save, you can go back in time and undo your mistakes, can't you? And that ultimately get to the end of the game. So I suppose actually, yeah, so a computer game, that's an interesting idea, isn't it? A single player linear computer game is kind of a multiverse where different states of gameplay exist, but it's all the same thing, but at different, at different places. That's an interesting idea. Just do the Dallas Dream thing. No, no, <laughs> can't do that. <laughs> um, using a multiverse to reset is used extensively in comic books. Okay, abstract play says that's quite interesting. Um, so, um, um, so um, uh, yeah, so the, the, yeah, interesting stuff. Now, I must admit, I've never played with it. I haven't. I, I suppose because most of the writing that I've done has been um, story driven. Um, Shadewood is set in a 
is yeah, I, I've kind of set most of my stuff and not all of it I would say but most of my stuff is set in what is probably designed to be the future of this universe okay so um, Shadewood for example is set in I think I think I've worked it out uh, about the year 4,000 four, four and a half thousand AD when you add up all the numbers and not that it really matters because Earth doesn't is no longer inhabitable but um, it's about the year 4500 AD but it's just the future okay so it's it's this universe it's not a parallel universe it's a universe which I've postulated is the end result of where we are today and what happens in the future okay it's made up because it's made up as a story but it's not a parallel universe it's it's the future of now and even you know even something that I've written for like elite um, you know elite dangerous it's set in the future of now it's not really set in a parallel universe it's set in you know it's set in the year 3400 isn't it 30 no 30 yeah sorry 34th century 3307 as it is now um, it's set in a year in the future of now it's not in a parallel universe um, so um, <laughs> Rob's 2610 I think I married a priestess I can't hide anything from her <laughs> uh, I don't think marrying one of them would be a good idea at all <laughs> um, Dr. Quest MD, I think the multiverse is good to allow other writers to work on the same material from a different perspective instead of the same writer attempting to make an alternative path. That's quite a good idea. Um, is that um, you know you could have different writers working on the same source material but set them in different parallel universes. That's quite good. Um, that's quite interesting. Um, okay, Bill Gobey Evans says there's not too many spoilers in terms of the multiverse, so that, that's quite interesting. Um, um, Come on, Sorrowful, I like how restrained the elite lore is. It's just no sugar rush, no epic end game throw. It's just more... There's, there's a bit of history. Yep, uh, there's definitely a bit of history. Um, uh, Glenn's is so true. In your shape with universe, in the past, was there a Drew Waker who was a prophet who wrote the future already? <laughs> yes, but he, um, he, he never amounted to much. <laughs> Sold some books and everyone forgot who he was. Um, that's an interesting point, isn't it? Because... Because I've thought about that, not 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 that particular example, but um, you know when <laughs> let's say let's take Star Trek for example. When when they go back in time to um, um, 1985, let, let's let, let's take the episode with the whales. Which one's that? Star Trek Four. That you know um, they go back in time. I think to 1985 in order to pinch some humpback whales from San Francisco and then take them back to the future. You know it's <laughs> a really stupid plot, but it's quite fun. Okay. Um, is you know um, they get they, they end up back in 1985 okay and they're wandering around San Francisco now you would have thought the the cast of Star Trek would be very recognisable in 1985 wandering around San Francisco and uh, I'm I'm always watching those films going why doesn't somebody go it's Captain Kirk <laughs> can I have your autograph <laughs> that never happens for some strange reason it's almost as if Star Trek never happened in the universe where Star Trek went back to. <laughs> you see what I mean? Um, so, oh, it's Leonard Nimoy. No, 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 my name's Spock. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, you're in character, I get it. No, 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 I really am Spock. <laughs> no, 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 I get it. I get, I, I get your act here, it's fine, it's fine. Just, just sign this book, will you? <laughs> Signs it Spock. <laughs> Look, you signed it Spock, not Leonard Nimoy. Hey, well, never mind. <laughs> Oh, hang on a minute, they really did get aboard the Klingon battleship and disappear into the future. Wow. Etc. <laughs> Etc. Et so one of the one of the rules of going back in time in a science fiction show is that the science fiction show that you're in didn't happen in that universe. That's that seems to be a rule. Uh, because you can reference everybody else's show, but you're not allowed to reference your own show. So apparently the show that you're in didn't happen. In that, in that, in that universe. But anyway, there we go. Um, <laughs> JR 1988 is now kind of like struggling with this. <laughs> Star Trek never happened in the universe where Star Trek happened. That's exactly it. That seems to be the law. Uh, <laughs> what if Captain Kirk encountered William Shatner after? Well, you see, he should be able to, shouldn't he? Because if Captain Kirk arrives back in 1985, William Shatner is on set fil filming. Star Trek 4, surely. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, they get, they, where are the nuclear vessels? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Where indeed? 
Um, so that's 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 a problem, I think, for for time traveling stuff. But um, <laughs> um, and then go. Okay, so catch you. <laughs> Sorry for that slight drift there. Um, by the way, there's okay. So um, uh, Glenn was asking. In the shape, was there a Drew Egger? So I, I think, and I think I agree with um, Bilbo Gavins here, self-inserts, the cardinal sin of writing. Now, I, I did commit this sin in Elite Dangerous. Um, so if you look in Reclamation, there is a small scene um, where I did put myself in the Elite Dangerous universe. I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> I couldn't resist, okay? Because at the time I thought, well, this is, this is a one-off thing, right? I'm gonna write this Elite Dangerous novel and then that's it. And I thought, yeah, this is this is this is my chance to actually exist in Elite, um, you know, a, a game and a franchise I've followed since I was a kid. Um, so I, I, I'm afraid I buckled under pressure. And so there is a scene. I don't get, I don't name myself, uh, but there is a scene in um, in Reclamation where um, I think it's I think if I remember right, Salome's in a lift on one of the space stations, and there's this family on the other side, and um, it's it, it's me. <laughs> I, I don't have a major part, um, I hasten to add. Um, so yeah, so in a moment of weakness, I did do that. Now I haven't done that in anything else. I haven't done that in anything else. Um, and I, yeah, and I generally agree that that's, that's, a, <laughs> that's an appalling thing to do, inserting yourself into a novel. So no, um, in the Shadewood universe, I have to follow that same Star Trek thing, okay? That whatever it is that you are writing doesn't exist if you go back in time. So there isn't a Drew Wager in the Shadewood universe, okay? It never existed, um, I think. <laughs> um, um, so you know, so that's that that that's something I think you you are you are wise to avoid. You know, you're wise to avoid. Um, so yeah, so I don't name myself in Elite Reclamation, but I am in there. Um, um, <laughs> it's the one at the bar trying to buy a drink. No, I'm not at the bar trying to buy a drink. <laughs> um, I think, as I recall, I'm just trying. I haven't read Reclamation for years now, so I can't remember the story. Um, yeah, there's definitely a scene where Salome is in a lift. They've gone to a space station. I can't remember why they're at the space station. I think maybe to get repairs to Luko's ship. So I think it's after where Luko rescues Salome from the planet. They go to a space station so that she can send a message to the Empire. And I think it's while she's on that space station. I think. Or somewhere like that. Um, and, 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 you know, Stanley, now I, I don't mind the little, I mean, Stanley, that's a good example, okay, again, of the, um, you know, the insert. I don't, I, you know, I think if you put a little low key thing in, you know, and I quite like the Stanley inserts in the, um, in the Marvel films where he basically just, he just plays some cantankerous old bloke who has a, a single quip in each film, doesn't he? <laughs> He's just, he's just some guy. He's not him. He's kind of not himself, is he? He's kind of just a, a cantankerous old guy, <laughs> who's just like, get on my lawn. Or it's like, what are you doing? You know, he just has a line, doesn't he? Which is, which is quite fun. Um, and yet he's sort of a, he's sort of a multiverse character, isn't he? Who exists in in all sorts of different places. Um, now I've just realised actually that I do, I do have a multiverse. I have a single multiverse item in all of my books um, so it's, and some of you will have seen this now I, I kind of um, I'm trying to think why I started doing this and I think I started doing it just because it was a bit of a laugh because um, I wanted something for readers to look out for and find um, is that in in all of my books there is a an item okay an item that is common to all of the books so it appears in every single um, book not not actually every single book but every single series that I've ever written there is a a thing okay that appears in all of them so if you don't know what it is I'm not going to spoil it for you because uh, but it's basically an item that appears in all um, all of the all of the books somewhere it's basically it's in Elite it's in Lords of Midnight it's in Shadewood and it's the same thing um, and I put it in there really as a sort of I don't know sort of a mischievous um, thing <laughs> um, you know, so there is a there is an item. It's not a person. It's not a, a character. It's a it's an item that appears in all of my um, universes that I've written in, um, and it, it, it's it's there. So you need to find it. It's in all of the book. It's in all of the stories. So it's I can pinpoint it specifically if you like. It's in Elite Reclamation. 
Um, it might be in Premonition, actually. I can't remember. Um, it's definitely in Elite Reclamation. It's definitely in Lords of Midnight. And it's in Shadewood Book 2. Uh, it's the same thing in all of... <laughs> Is it my hat pin? No, it's not. Um, <laughs> it's in all this. So I have actually got a multi... I have, I have unwittingly, and I haven't thought about it before, actually, in terms of the conversation around tonight. I have unwittingly got a multiverse thing. Because none of those universes are connected. Okay? None of those universes are connected. Uh, VW Golf. <laughs> Is it in nine streams of consciousness? No, I don't think it is actually. That's a good point. Because that was such a short story, I don't think I put it in there. Um, because it would be quite hard work to put a device like that in, in lots and lots of short stories all the time. Um, <laughs> golf. Um, but actually, G.R. Night, although a Volkswagen Golf in The Lords of Midnight would be quite an anachronism, um, it, um, the thing that is in there is quite an anachronism in Lords of Midnight. It doesn't it doesn't fit in the story. So I had to be quite creative in how I put it there. So see if you can find it. I'm going to leave it. Um, <laughs> um, Bilbo Gavin says, one thing worse than the self-insert, and that's the Mary Sue. So, OK, so yeah, so we, we talked about um, um, Mary Sue's before. And that, yeah, you mustn't do that. You mustn't, you mustn't, I mean, probably not for a published novel. If you want to write wish fulfillment novel, then you know, just do it for yourself. <laughs> Don't inflict it on anybody else. Um, you have to work quite hard to make sure you don't do that. Uh, Casper24, it's a device. Yes, it is a device. It's a device, okay? So Elite Reclamation, Lords of Midnight, and Shadewood 2, which is Exoneration. Um, and so my my Drew, my Drewiverse, <laughs> Drewniverse, the Drewniverse, I like that, uh, is connected by all of these things. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out for that. See if you can figure out what it is. Um, and... Um, but yeah, I, you know, I haven't done that specifically to create a multiverse. I've just put it in for a bit of fun. Um, so, you know, so that sort of stuff. is. But, you know, the the idea there of a multiverse to support that kind of thing is, is, is actually quite compelling. Uh, and I don't blame any writers for using that um, mechanism to um, um, connect connect things up. <laughs> Let's try to guess what it is now. Is it a Golf Mark II? No, it's what a Golf Mark II be doing in any of those books? <laughs> Is it a hat bin? No, it's not a hat bin. Et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, go go and find out. That's that's a quest. There you go. There's your quest. You can tell me next week if you find it. Um, and see if see if you can locate it. And, and in order to win, I think you've got to you've got to tell me in what scene the item is. Then I can check whether or not you're right or not. Um, so you've you said what it is in the past. I, I can't remember what I've said. Um, it's more fun to guess wrong. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, anyway, so for those of you who don't know what it is, you can go off and find it. Um, the VW Cobra Mark III GTI. <laughs> Which I think wins, actually. I think that's what they should be. Um, so, so that's quite good. So, um, you know, if you're going to if you're going to use something like that, then I think you just you need to give it a little bit of thought about as you know, what sort of multiverse things do you want to use. And I think um, was it Rob to twenty six ten that you know don't use it as an excuse to get out of poor decision making on behalf of your characters and say oh we've just got a multiverse we'll just hop into a more compatible one. Um, I think it's a valid way of exploring the what ifs of a scenario. I think that's really powerful. Um, I think, you know, the idea of potentially having conflict between multiverses. I was actually, um, it was completely coincidental, actually, um, that I was watching an episode of Star Trek Next Generation this evening, which was called Parallels, which I which um, I come up with tonight's topic in advance of that, but it just happened to that we were watching this episode. And that's an episode in which Worf moves between quantum realities. Um, and at the end of the show, there's this quite neat scene where quantum... Um, universes leak into the kind of primary universe and you get multiple enterprises all pe appearing <laughs> in space uh, and they have to find the right enterprise so Wolf can get back to the you know the correct quantum reality or something like that um, and it's you know, it's, you know it's, it's silly but it's quite a fun episode of Star Trek um, but one of, the, one of the most compelling bits actually in the entire episode was that there's this one shot of an enterprise from a universe where the Borg have basically won and the Federation's been destroyed and the Enterprise is pretty much the only ship left um, in existence. And basically you get this shot of 
uh, I think it's Riker, if I remember quite right, because he's on the bridge of this battered enterprise, and he's basically saying, don't send us back, please don't send us back to our universe, we want to stay here. And the, you know, the current Riker, who exists in this dimension, basically has the choice to sort of destroy his ship and you know, or send him back into... You know the hell that he he inhabits. So there is you know there's there's this there's this sort of slightly horror version of the parallel universe thing that you could explore. In which case you visit a universe where everything is really really bad and unpleasant. Um, you know so so things like that I think are quite good as well. Um, <laughs> is it a David Braybourne bobblehead? <laughs> um, uh, Drew Wager with a beard now. Yeah, that'd be quite scary, wouldn't it? Um, so we're receiving 15,000 hills, that Electro Raptor, that's it, yeah, that's the, that's the exact show. Um, and Farscape has a good parallel universe episode. I haven't seen Farscape for ages, need to watch that again. Um, um, a TV series I watch seem to use multiverse to keep actors after the characters get killed. <laughs> I suppose that's quite a cheap way I'll go, who are you again? Didn't we kill you? Oh yeah, well I'm from a parallel universe. I'm not the original one. And I think even, as I recall, even Star Trek... Um, uh, uh, Voyager did that, didn't they? I think they did that with Harry Kim, is that he died in one of the episodes, but because they were connected to a parallel universe at a time, the Harry Kim from the other universe joined them on their ship, where the other Enterprise was going to be destroyed anyway, so he would have died. So he kind of... Um, yeah, he kind of died. The actual real Harry Kim, if you like, died. Then we got the replacement from the parallel universe to kind of fill his shoes, because the guy in... You know, he would have died if he had stayed in his parallel universe so he came into this universe and continued existing but he's not actually the same Harry Kim as the one we started out with um, <laughs> and as I recall there's quite a cool conversation with Janeway right? you know, you know the Star Trek always has um, that little conversation at the end where they all go ha 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 and then it's like roll credits <laughs> it's basically a conversation between Harry Kim and Janeway saying well actually um, your Harry Kim is dead, and um, I'm from a parallel universe, so this isn't my ship, and you're not, you're not my captain. Um, and yet everything seems to be fine. And Jamie just basically quips back with, "Weird is part of the job in Starfleet, or something like that." <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of like I've just come from a completely parallel universe, and actually I'm not the Harry Kim that you knew. But hey, never mind, um, etc. You know. <laughs> um, and Tashi Yar, you know, there, there's another parallel universe thing. Exactly right. Um, oh, that's uh, Electro Raptor. That's episode Magic Space Stuff, Clones Voyager, but it's not Antimatter Reserve because of reasons. Yeah, that's right. It's always reasons, are they? Space reasons. Um, so there's, there's some quite, you know, interesting ideas like that, which I think are quite fun to explore science fiction wise. So um, is it a good trope to use? I think, I think it is. I think it's a very powerful one. I think you've got to, like most of these things, you've got to be a bit wary of what's been written before. And, and, and figure out you know a good way of using it but it's very very powerful and shows up in a lot of fantasy a lot of sci-fi i think it's a really good um mechanism to explore all the what if questions what if you know what if i have toasted them all into the complex um you know all those sort of things and and you know all the big questions you know in your life you know what would have happened if you hadn't done that thing you know what if you had taken that job what if you hadn't taken that job uh, what if we had got married? What if we hadn't got married? What if we didn't have kids? You know, <laughs> how much richer would you be? <laughs> um, you know, all those sort of things, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, you know, I think I think I think it's a powerful thing, and you know, it, you know, sometimes it can be technologically driven. Some kind of it can be some sort of magic portal. Um, and, you know, sometimes it can be an accident. All those sort of things. Um, I sort of I, th I think there's a quite quite powerful thing. So I'm I'm not, certainly not averse to using it. I haven't consciously used it. Um, uh, Gigi, do you have a Voyager MIDI? Uh, <laughs> I don't, but I could probably do it. It's not a very complicated tune. That one is a do 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 do. That one I think is is fairly <laughs> fairly easy for me to midify. Um, I have I've deliberately not done Star Trek MIDI files on my streams because I'm sure the copyright um, ban hammers would come down on me pretty hard. Um, <laughs> Glenn says, if you haven't had kids, at least your grandson could not come back in time and kill you. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, actually. Don't have grandchildren, okay? It's very, very dangerous from a science fiction perspective. Um, so, you know, so... <laughs> That's quite. I always did like um, 
uh, Professor Stephen Hawkins attempt to check whether or not time travel has existed uh, because he basically his test which was quite elegant I thought um, was um, basically to host a party for time travelers on a particular date but not advertise the party until two days after the party had happened <laughs> and basically so he held the party on Tuesday uh, whatever the date was <laughs> and then the following Thursday he sent out the invitations everywhere he could think of to say time travelers party last Tuesday <laughs> and the experiment was of course on Tuesday uh, saying that he was you know he had guaranteed to himself that he would send out the invitation <laughs> the following Thursday to see if anybody turned up and to his great disappointment nobody did <laughs> so that was I think the only actual um, test vaguely scientific test for do time travelers exist um, that I <laughs> I know it's actually been carried out by anybody vaguely reputable. Um, so, so there we go. Um, um, <laughs> can you write an AI like the Doctor of Voyager? Uh, um, in an ED story, that would be quite fun, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> um, if it's a multiverse, they could come back in time to give because they could be your grandchildren. <laughs> Getting very, um, very confusing. Um, all that food wasted, yeah, so I don't know. It sounds like quite an interesting thing. But anyway, there we go. So that's the multiverse. Um, I think quite an interesting topic. Um, I think there's a lot more you can do with it. And that, you know, a lot of people are um, science fiction fantasy have used it as a device for telling stories, which again, of course, is the ultimate reason for all of this sort of stuff anyway. But um, so there you go. So there we go. Anyway, my friends, it is, it is time once again. So um, <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed yet another um, waffly diversion into the, into the great depths of space and time. <laughs> it's always a pleasure on Monday evenings. I shall be back once more on Thursday uh, with no more No Man's Sky. So my, my little Elite Dangerous stream on Sunday was a, kind of a bit of a one-off just for Update 6. So I have no idea when Update 7 is coming. So when it does come, then we'll, we'll go back and have a quick look at Elite Dangerous again. But I'm not planning on doing anything firm on Elite Dangerous until it works. You yeah, know, that's, that's, that's the status. Um, so No Man's Sky on Thursday. Uh, there won't be a stream on Saturday, I'm afraid, because I'm going to be hooning around on the racetrack with my eldest son um, in, a, in a couple of cars. We're going to a track day, so that should be um, that should be good. Um, and uh, we can go on from there. So um, there we go. Um, the, <laughs> the time travellers attended Hawking's party in another universe. He'll be so disappointed. <laughs> uh, dear. Um, Bilbo Gammons really enjoyed the stream. Thank you very much. Um, Ledwin 883 lurked but tremendously enjoyed the stream. Oh, good to see you. A, 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 a new face. Hello, welcome to welcome to, uh, to that as well. Um, Miss Walker 227. The problem with testing time travel, real or not, is likely just forcing it to happen. There'll be likely rules in the future. Yeah, so non-interference, non non temporal prime directives, and things like that. Um, so. <laughs> Brilliant, Drew. Thanks to all you, which universe you're from. Who knows? Um, it's all good. So, thank you. If you're new, um, thank you for popping along. If you're if you're lurking in the chat and you haven't said anything yet, then welcome as well. It's always good to see new folks. The idea of this stream is is a light-hearted take on fantasy and sci-fi. We would just discuss a topic that's relevant to it. And if there's writing advice that you'd like to hear something about, then just ask a question. That's how, that's how it always works. So it's a friendly, friendly, happy place to be and talk about um, some sci-fi. So we never get distracted at all anything we're really absolutely razor sharp and on point all of the time <laughs> not <laughs> um, so anyway there we go anyway take care my friends have a lovely week I hope it all goes well for you see you on Thursday for some No Man's Sky and then we'll be back again next Monday for more of this science fiction fantasy there won't be a stream on Saturday I'm afraid so I shall see you then <laughs> take care my friends see you soon and it, yes we always upload to YouTube after the event so look out for it there take care have a fantastic week ahead and I will speak to you soon. Right on, as always. See you soon.